Well, good morning and good morning, hi, Dale. Good morning, It is an honor to be sitting here with Dale Nitschke, the CEO and founder of Ovative Group. I'm Shalisa DeMuth, the executive director here at Beta. Now, Ovative came on this year as a partner with us, and when I think about Ovative, I think about goodness, really good people who show up for each other, and so what we want to do today is get into really the secrets of your growth. Um, so the session is titled, Raising the Fucking Bar, and I don't hesitate to say that, and I know none of your team hesita hesitates to say that either, uh, because that's really what you've done, and that's a core value. Uh, so I'm interested to kick off with a little bit of your history. So you had a very long career building out Target.com. Tell us about how that informed what you're doing at Ovative and a little bit of the origin story of your organization. Yeah, sure, thanks, Shalisa. I appreciate this opportunity to tell the story. Hopefully, some of these ideas might be helpful to, to all of you. Um, so I started Ovative when I was 47 years old. So um, it was something that, uh, you know, oftentimes founders are viewed as younger people, um, but I really believe that anybody can start something anytime they want, right? And, and um, to never stop that kind of energy. Um, I started, it was Dayton Hudson Corporation, that's how old I am, um, in 1984, and my first office in Dayton's was at, it, I was starting in the stores, and it was in the infant area of the Rosedale store in the lower level, and it was in a fitting room was my office. And you know, so as um, people, moms and dads was coming, change their kids' diapers and on, on my desk, and as a 22-year-old, I was like, okay, this is interesting. Um, so I spent a lot of time walking around and listening to people, and I think that's part of, part of my energy every day. Um, eventually became a merchant, and then when Target.com was formed, I, I got the privilege of, of leading that organization, and it was one that I think they offered the job to about 12 other people before they got to me, you know, and I was only the first one to say yes. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and, um, you know, part of that was the department stores were kind of going like this, Target was going like this, and, you know, the, the internet was beginning to happen. This was 1999. Um, and I also got the responsibilities for Target's guest database, which at that, that time um, was a disparate group of databases across the, the organization and trying to think about how do you pull this together and create value. Um, I did that for eight years and um, it was a great, great uh, experience in thinking about how do you put teams and, and values and culture together and infrastructure all, all of course backed by the bullseye, which makes it a lot easier to, to, to do things, right? Um, and, um, but after eight years, I felt like um, I just needed to do something else, you know? And it was just, I was mid-40s and thinking about this was a long run. Um, and was watching and thinking about we were spending more and more money in digital media, and yet we were still optimizing to target.com results. Um, which at that time was like one percent of the business. It didn't. It didn't really matter, right? And that felt like the, the wrong thing to do. And a couple team members that actually are now part of Ovative um, did some Skunk Works work where they were able to track what people search for online, went to Target.com, and then went to the store. And it was like the six-month analysis to figure all this out. But we were like, okay, that's a really good idea. That if we can break through and think about how do we measure media in a different way. Um, to the enterprise level, that'd be super valuable for, for organizations. And so um, I, I, was, I was ready to leave. You know, I was in a place personally where I, I wasn't that, um, you know, I wasn't my best self, I would say. So how do I change my environment? And um, I thought, let's start Oveda. Incredible. So a career as the president of Target.com and founder of Ovative. So tell us a little bit more about the, the mission and the vision and the values that are behind what you built. Clearly you, you came to a place where you knew something needed to change and you chose to create it. And I know a lot of founders in the audience can, can connect with that story. Yeah, tell us how you've, how you've built the culture at Ovative. Yeah, I think the mission and vision are really important for an organization to center around all the time. And, and for us, our, our vision is to transform the measure of marketing success. So it's a very aspirational. I was kind of inspired by Bain created an NPS like 70 years ago or something, you know, on a project for, for some client somewhere. And I thought, well, could we come up with a, a metric that we now call EMR um, to transform how 
the whole industry measured the effectiveness of their marketing. And so it's a very high vision, ambitious, and will probably never ac accomplish it, but it's important for the organization to be centered around something that's, that's compelling and, and drives change and motivates people and like inspires people to try to do something. Um, and then the, on, the, on the mission side, um, I, you know, I think many founders and you know are inspired by this opportunity to kind of come up with a blank, blank slate of you know what are what is what do you want your company to be? And you know, we spent time thinking about what are the the core values of the organization. How do we want to treat one another? And you know, what do we really what were we inspired by either with groups that we were um, you know, affiliated with or teams we had been on or companies that we work for? And what 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 could we be? Um, and that, that, that mission um, is fearlessly unlocking potential, and we're thinking about how do we help. It, initially, it was actually th thought of around the data, you know, because we're thinking about, oh, let's unlock the, the potential for our, our, our clients through the data, which still is part of our, our, our mission, but it's really centered now on our team members and thinking about how do we create an environment provide tools, surround people with people that inspire them and help them um, change and improve as individuals, and you know, consistently try to bring that to life and have that as a, a, an important part of the conversation anytime we're talking about team or org structure or promotions or new experiences for team members. That's really fascinating. Um, you have experienced Explosive growth, not only in the business, the clients that you're serving, the change that you're affecting, uh, but also in talent acquisition. So as we consider mission and vision and values, um, starting intentionally that way, how has that affected your talent acquisition efforts? And what has that looked like since, since founding in 2009? Yeah, I mean, I appreciate being here to, to, to talk about growth. Like, we don't, we, don't, we don't focus on growth per se, and I know a lot of you know, um, companies that are starting up, their investors are, you know, you have to have this type of growth and all that stuff. We, we center, you know, we're, we're um, thankfully in many ways liberated because we, we, we self-funded, so it's all just cash flow and, and it enables us to make decisions that I think, um, you know, it's very liberating, honestly, you know, that to be able to sit in a room with people that you, you trust and love and, you know, what do you want to do here and let's go do it. Um, but anyway, um, so we focus on trying to do great work um, and I think that, that 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 energy is what has enabled us to grow. And w why that's so important is, is if you continue to do great, great work, you attract people who are inspired by and like working with people who want to be great at what they do. Um, and that, that's a very, very powerful thing that I think is underrated. <laughs> you know, if, you're, if you're, you're good with good, your team's just gonna be good. If you're good with very good, your team's just going to be very good. If you expect great, you know, and expect people to stretch, and RTFB, I have trouble saying all those words, so I use RTFB, but raise, raise the bar every day, you're able to um, attract great people, and that, of course, great people enable you to keep great clients, and then great clients grows and attracts more great clients, so then you can attract more great people. So it's kind of the snowball effect. And you can see, you know, we moved from, you know, um, founded in 09, 21 people in, in 14, so we're a little over, four, about 450 people right now. We'll end the year a little bit short of 500. Um, and, and, you know, to your question about um, talent services, like we, we, we are exceptionally fortunate to hire people on our talent services team who are just, um, you know, they're our greatest brand ambassadors um, and they, they know our vision, they know our mission. Um, Bonnie Gross, who leads that team, she led um, Target's digital marketing organization and was one of the beginning groups of Cartwheel, which was an app that, that, that was formed. So super, super talented business person. Um, but like she's just the, I mean, everybody that meets Bonnie, you know, your heart's a little bit bigger um, because you, you met her. So like she's somebody who um, inspires in a different way than I inspire, right? So it's a great compliment. Anyway, she leads our talent services team. I, I, I strongly believe that, um, I mean, we don't call them HR, nothing against HR professionals, but um, 
I want a strategic partner. People are the most important thing um, in an organization, and I want somebody to really has that energy about how powerful have, forming the right team, having the right structure, clear accountabilities, and I need, you know, we, we expect that team to help do those elements, and then also um, focus on developing people, and you know, where, how do we stretch them, how do we give them those experiences, how do we train them, and how do we onboard people, you know, obviously onboarding that many people, I think we've onboarded 170 people this year, um, and in the pandemic, we, were, we onboarded 120 people. We'd never onboarded people virtually before, so it was like, let's crack a lacko. We got to figure this out pretty fast. <laughs> and and, and uh, the team did an amazing job. Um, but it's all part of, um, you know, it starts with our talent services team, and it starts with our brand reputation in the market. First of all, congratulations. That is just, inc that's incredible, exceptional growth in such a short amount of time. Um, when you consider the pillars of, of your growth and the, the way that you develop a people first culture, what, what does that look like from a leadership perspective? And then um, how do you deploy that mindset and mentality to your team to stay people first? Yeah, I think, you know, most organizations have um, constituencies and a target, you know, we talked about our guests or our customers, um, there was the shareholder, of course, so, you know, uh, making sure we're delivering for them, there's community and there's the team members, you know, and those were the four that I, that was kind of how I was trained and, you know, built um, for those 23 years. And so I brought that to, to, to Ovative and um, initially we were thinking, you know, we started with client and then we moved to team. Um, and then we moved to community, and then we moved to Oveda. So that was kind of the order in which we made decisions. Um, with the pandemic, I think it really kind of uh, made us kind of reconsider and rethink that. And we've shifted, at least in my head, and my, my, how I kind of think through these things is, we shifted to team first, and really started to organize and prioritize enabling our team to succeed and grow and develop as people um, first with the belief that that's gonna impact our client in a way that's that's healthier and in this environment, a more important kind of shift that our team feels it, you know, and they understand and they can, they can um, you know, really be something that, you know, like when we do uh, next Friday, we have an all day training on emotional intelligence. We fly everybody in and, um, last Tuesday, you know, we flew everybody in to go to a soccer game. You know, it's like we're committed to bringing people together and helping them grow as people and thinking about different ways so that that, that intentional action of shifting your prioritization is something that I think sometimes people don't think about and it, it, it's probably a good thing to kind of take an inventory on every once in a while. Um, values are super important, you know, and, and like, um, it's so easy to have, you know, like we have them painted on our stairs and people see them and it's like, you know, like that's not what values are, right? But, but, but we put them there and, and, you know, it reminds people. Um, it's making decisions and connecting them to your, your, your um, values and, and really being transparent and saying, the reason I made this decision is because it supports our values. You know, and just tying that together and consistency is something that people look for, and I, I've, um, you know, got had the opportunity to work with lots of leaders. And when I was thinking about that, the, that career, or the people that touched me in my career, is like, I love that they were super consistent. I may have disagreed with them vehemently, but they were super consistent in, in how they um, thought and the, the values that they brought to the situations. And so I think that's a big one that enables people to trust. Right, people need to be liberated to go and do their best, and having that those those values as the foundation is important, and then the vision of you know the the high ambition vision um, that inspires people with the values underneath is a critical kind of part of the infrastructure that I think most companies could use. Um, that committing to the mission and vision is another one. So those I've talked about that already. And then investing in infrastructure. This is so. This is one that I learned at Target.com, right? So we went from, I think it was eight million dollars when I when I when I got there. Like we literally could see transactions. We launched. I remember when we launched Cribs, the team could fit in a room smaller than this, and we actually saw the first crib come through. The order come through. And we were like, yeah, we sold one. You know, <laughs> I mean, it was like early days, right? Um, 
but then we had to figure out, okay, we had to figure out fulfillment and, and you know, servers at the time and the scale, everything, you know, and it was like, oh my gosh, I've never done this before. So how do you, you're thinking three years out all the time, three years out all the time, because it takes that long, either for the organization to grow and get expertise or to, to build things, right? You know, so, so that, that dynamic, um, I think we've done a good job of being ahead of the game. So our HR infrastructure, our financial infrastructure, our um, training and development infrastructure is in place. So as we got to 450 people, it's not like people are like, oh my God, this is impossible, we can't do this. It's like, okay, we're, we're ready, well, let's go. Um, and we're ready for 600 now. You know, so you think about the future all the time and you start seeding those early. So that, that's what I mean by investing in infrastructure. So it's like managing to the current in a consistent way and anticipating the future and investing. Huh, those future investments are so important and investing in your people. One thing that I think as a founder myself, of course, before having come to beta and working with founders every day, uh, communication is such an important part of leadership and such an important part of scaling. So you talk about values and investing in infrastructure and celebrating wins. Um, growing from 21 people at the start to over 400 one now. One person at the start. Yeah, one person at the start, yeah, like us all. Uh, as you grow, uh, as, as you've grown so rapidly, how has communication looked internally to communicate values and celebrate wins as you've scaled? Yeah, um, so I think transparency is another really, really, really important thing. And like we kind of think about it in terms of, and which demands communication, right? So. You, you can't be transparent if you're not communicating. Um, so I, I, my kind of mental thing that I think about is I want to give my team all the information they need to decide to stay, right? You know, and, and that means, you know, the pipeline, the, you know, who's left the company, the hiring plans, the financial plans, what your bonus is going to look like. Um, this is why we're making this decision versus that decision, you know, input. And it's, um, it demands like intentional platforms to do that. And, and um, you know, we, we do, we still to, to this day, we do a Tuesday all team stand up. Every two weeks I stand up and talk about what I'm thinking about and we do the financial updates. And, it, and the energy behind it is anybody can ask any question and it's, it's different than, uh, what's the word, that rat, radical feedback or whatever. I, I'm not a huge fan of that, but I'm, I'm a huge fan of transparency where um, anybody ask any question other than like personal details of other people, um, you know, we will answer it to the best of our ability and share, this is, this is one idea, I mean, I have a whiteboard in my office where I have like basically the things I'm thinking about and uh, whether it's an intern or a senior vice president, I'm like, okay, here's the things, <laughs> what do you think about these things, <laughs> you know, right? what, what, what do you like about it, what do you not like about it, and, it, and it's a, uh, um, that I think that whiteboard has had more pictures taken of it, um, mostly by me, so I remember the stuff. Um, but um, than, than any whiteboard, at least innovative. But I think I mean, you gotta you gotta share. I mean, like I came from a, I, I, you know, I mean, Target's a fantastic organization, and, um, and my reflection on it is, you know, old, like 20, 30 years ago, right? Um, but it, there could have been a little bit more of the whys. Um, and understand what the, why the decisions were made, and I always felt like mm, if I'm running something, I could I'm, I'm going to share more of that. So another question about communicating: You've had a lot of wins throughout the years. Uh, of course, we take some losses too. But when you celebrate wins as a team, I think it would be interesting for everyone to understand how how do you like to reward people? How do you celebrate together as a team uh, when you do have have milestones that you hit? Yeah, I'm not very good at it, um, um, honestly, <laughs> um, be because I'm always kind of on to the next, you know, so I, I rely on others to be better at celebrating than myself, and, you know, like Bonnie is a great celebrator, um, but I do enjoy um, getting people together and celebrating each other, um, so we, like, we do a lot of these, you know, almost every month or every other month for sure, we have a, we just we're willing, you know, fly everybody in and, and get together and celebrate something. So, you know, it's whether we, we happen to have a great environment, um, you know, so we have concerts on the rooftop, we have go to the soccer games, you know, like where we celebrate being together and being 
a team and getting to know one another, which as I reflect at my age, like the biggest gift that I have in my life is the connections and the relationships and the friends that I have. And that's where I get the most rewards. And I'm like, okay, how do we enable that um, for this group of people that are much earlier stage in their careers and thinking about those, those relationships are probably the most valuable thing, or you know, one or two of those relationships will be the most valuable thing of their experience at Ovative. So how do we help people form that? People, um, and it's always interesting to me, um, it's hard to change behavior, you know, and part of our, our role as marketers is trying to change behavior, but it's hard to change your team member's behavior, right? You know, and they all say they want to do something, but actually, okay, I gotta, you know, if we were gonna change chairs, we'd look at each other and go, I don't know, do you really want to change a chair? You know, <laughs> you know, so like any type of behavior is hard to do, and um, so we try to create opportunities, don't force people, but give them opportunities to engage with one another. And that that's the celebration. I mean, we have a crazy party called the Shenanigans Day every year that was formed to celebrate one another. And there's a committee that plans it. No one knows what's gonna go on that day. It's like top secret and no one knows what's gonna happen. And when you think in your life, like how many days do you walk into that you have no idea what's gonna happen? For me, it's like zero, right? <laughs> but shenanigans day, no one knows what's going to happen. So it's, I, and when you're when you're doing something you're kind of uncomfortable with with others, you bond, you know. So we create opportunities where people are a little bit uncomfortable. You know, let's go, take the whole team curling. How many people have curled? Like three people. Okay, so everybody's doing it for the first time. They bond because they remember, you know, Dale fell down, somebody else ripped their pants, you know, like all that stuff that's cool, or just people remember, it drives relationships. So I, I think that's the biggest thing you can do rather than, you know, here's this or that to celebrate. It's like, how do you bring people together? Bringing people together, and that's really what marketing is, right? And that's the, the change that you're affecting with, mm -hmm. uh, with what Ovative is. Outside of outside of team, the whole company culture, uh, really, and the, the clients that you serve, that's what you're affecting. So I'd love to get into um, into a few more of these core values and talk about how they've really really driven growth for your team. So as you're developing leaders, as you're bringing people together, um, how important has has culture been? Um, Industry-wide, I think it's an important thing for us to, to touch on. Is culture here to stay? Is company culture and developing co company culture uh, something that will always be a discussion? Um, and how do you discuss it internally? How you uh, maintain culture as a team? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a choice of everyone, you know, kind of what, what your culture is going to be. Um, I, I view it back to kind of values and mission and vision, and those are the things that create the culture versus, like, let's talk about culture. Um, so I, I don't know, I kind of tease those apart. The outcome is the culture, not the, uh, you know, tac cultural tactics. I don't think of it that way. Um, you know, the one thing that's on the screen that I haven't touched on already that I think is important for, um, um, you know, these values and, and, and maybe the culture to align it is accountability. And um, so I still interview every single person that's considering joining Ovative. They get, you know, we have a hiring manager interview and a TS manager, so it's a little bit of vetting before it gets to me. But um, my purpose is not to, like, like we have four other people, we have, we have five people that interview everybody. And I know those four people will be able to discern whether the person can join in it and, and um, create value and, and has the experience or the expertise or whatever we're looking for. I, I'm, I don't worry about that. My, my platform and the conversation I have with the person is like I'm evaluating, I'm, I'm telling you that I'm going to hold you accountable to make Ovate it better. You know, and like this is our bond. You know Dale, and you're gonna hold me accountable to make Oveda better, and I'm gonna hold you accountable to bring your voice, bring your ideas, like show up and be engaged and be accountable to help us. Um, and that is something that resonates, I think, with people. And, um, and you know, they, I welcome my, the accountability they're going to have on me to make it better too. So like, it's a you know, it's a two-way street. It's not just me saying you have to make us better. But I always think about like I talk to some um, founders sometimes, and I'm like, well, 
do you, are you involved in the hiring process? And they're like, well, not really. You know, like I, my team does that. <laughs> I'm like, okay, your whole company is your people. Like, how can you not, like, uh, how can you not engage? Um, you know, so I, you know, and people ask me, how can you keep doing this? And like, I don't know, I did, you know, whatever, 300, 400 interviews last year. I think I can do 300, 400 interviews next year. You know, <laughs> it's not that hard. Um, you know, so, uh, and, and then, you know, it's a relationship. And it's not just like the CEO behind the curtain, which for me is important too. Like I, I'm at a stage of my life where I want to extend my friendships too and my work. My, 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 my network of people and people that help me grow as a person. And if I'm behind a curtain, I'm never gonna, never gonna be able to learn. You know? So accountability is gigantic, you know, and it's formed there and then it's, if your team's not accountable, it's, there's no way it's gonna work. You know, it's like zero, zero chance. Yeah, that communication and accountability is so critical. Uh, so something that you've, you've taught us, you taught us about shenanigans days. <laughs> and I love that concept, to keep an element of surprise for the team to, to bring people together and keep everyone agile. Um, we've discussed RTFB, what this discussion is all about, raising the fucking bar. Um, I'm also interested to learn a little bit about a word that you use or a phrase that you use at Ovative called enterprise marketing return. Mm -hmm. Can you explain that concept and how it affects your day to day? Yeah, so um, you know, in transforming um, the measure of marketing success, the measure for us is EMR. And when we started Ovative, we'd call it site to store. So we had retail backgrounds, right? And what that meant was people that went to the site, they also went to a store. And so we were like, okay, how do we measure that? So we understand not just the transactions that happen on the site and just optimize for that, we also think about site to store. And we tried to explain it to our clients, and the clients would kind of go, yeah, I don't really understand that. And certainly people that were, were not in the retail industry had no clue what we were talking about, right? You know, so it's like, okay, this is kind of dumb. Um, and one of our team members were, was like, Dale, this is dumb. We're a marketing company. We should call it something. I'm like, okay, you guys go figure out what to call it. And somebody sent me the string of the funny things that they were trying to call it. And it came back with EMR, Enterprise Marketing Return. And what that means is you're measuring online, or online and offline revenue. You're bringing the margin of the, that, that revenue into consideration. You're thinking about the value of the customer. And then you're thinking about the incrementality that the marketing was a causal. Did it, did it actually drive some behavioral change? And that's what EMR measures. And like as we think about that, like I, I go back to the vision and go back to like conversations that's transformational. Well, like coming up with a new metric in marketing is very hard. Like you know, people are I'm a last click row ad person, you know. And if you change it, my email results drop and my brand search results drop. You know, all this stuff. So you got to go back to the, like the C level people and what do they care about, right? And they care about profitable revenue. They care about customer value, and they care about if I'm spending a million dollars, I hope it's doing something, right? Very simple concept, and all of that resonates with EMR. So when we started calling it EMR, and we'd get in front of CMOs or CFOs or CEOs, they were like, I want that. That's what I want. <laughs> can you guys do that? <laughs> you know, we're like, yeah, 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 we can. Um, so like I think about, as you think about your concepts or your ideas for your, your organization, don't just you know, think about what it actually does, but think about what, how it inspires decision makers who then make, you know, the, the, they support it through the whole organization. It has to make sense for the people that are doing the work. Like you talk to a manager of marketing, they would say, I want that too, right? Like, so it's not like it's a different, like they don't want that, they want that because they look at how they spend their marketing dollars and they're like, this is stupid, why are we measuring this way? You know, and then, but I can't change it. And the senior leaders keep asking me about traffic and not, you know, and that's kind of dumb, you know, so, um, so they know it, but the, and then senior level people know it. And when you align those people, and then when you align not only the CEO, but the CMO and the CFO, I would always, I think the CFO, I mean, they, she holds the money, right? And when you, you know, when you think about how do you move the needle in an organization, the person with the money has a lot of lot to say about it, right? And if she supports 
changing the way we measure marketing because she understands it and she thinks she's getting a better investment or payback for her do dollars, it's a go. Um, we had one client that we moved from, they were doing $600 million in um, e-commerce revenue, or th through their influence, through their um, website before the pandemic. Two years later, they were doing $2 billion it, through the pandemic, right? And it's because the CFO, the, C the chief digital officer, and the CMO were aligned. And it was just go. If we spend a dollar and we can make a dollar fifty, we're going. And we're gonna take share when everybody else is on their heels. And um, you know, it, they, they, they crushed it. And their you know, stock went up 3X and they're all happy. And you know, uh, so they're, they're, a good, they're a good case study for us, right? But liberating people to make decisions around a central, central metric, whether it's in your own organization or whether it's for your clients, is amazing. You know, it just liberates people to go. And you know, I don't have to be involved. Nobody has, you know, if, it's, if it supports this, it's a go. Something that you just touched on that I want, I want to dig into a little deeper is alignment, that aspect of alignment. So of course, you've created explosive growth uh, at several organizations, but then you also affect that change with your clients. And so that example is a good one. Let's talk about how you do get senior leadership aligned as, as companies are growing and you're stepping in to, uh, to affect growth with them. What do those conversations look like? Yeah, I think, um, well, they're long, right? I mean, you know, change, behavioral change and like organizational change and metric change, like, you know, again, it's, we have an ambitious thing. So we think of it as a three-year adventure um, where it's, it's going to go like this, just like any change. You know, you're going to make headway and you're going to have a great meeting with the CFO and then she's going to forget that she met with you, you know, three months earlier and she's going to go back to asking the bad questions. So you got to get, you know, so it's like being super consistent, similar to what I talked about it with the, with the internally, like very transparent, super consistent, lots of different channels to communicate to people and keeping it in front of people and putting it in their terms and their context of what's important to them. Um, and then also having the patience, like sometimes my team will, oh, they don't get it. You know, like, well, how long have they been a client? You know, I, I think it's only four months. Like, they're not going to get it in four months. This is hard, right? Um, you know, so like reminding our, 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 the team that it's a long-term um, effort and, and that it's okay that it can be a long-term effort um, is, is super important. Change, change is hard, right? Change is hard. Change is hard, uh, but it's, it's necessary, right, for our growth. Um, one last thing that I want to touch on is as you've, as you've developed really strong company culture, you've gotten involved with community. Thank you again for your, uh, for your partnership with us this year at Beta to grow Twin Cities Start Startup Week. Um, how do you... How do you measure the success of, um, you know, the success of of that talent, uh, that talent ex expansion? So you partnered with us on the fly-in program. We had a great dinner at Ovative last night. For those who who were there, it's good to see you again. Um, we brought in 23 folks from around the country um, to experience what it is you're building at Ovative. Um, when we consider the processes that are, uh, that are involved in talent acquisition and, and the way that you're developing culture with your talent acquisition leads, um, how, do you, how do you measure the success of community engagement like what we had last night? Um, let, me, let me change the question a little bit. I think that's unclear. <laughs> yeah, no. Well, uh, I mean, I, I think uh, in general, I would say like uh, when the you know, when the ocean rises, all boats rise, you know? So there's just this, um, when I started at Dayton Hudson, it was the last year that one of the Dayton's brothers was this, the chairman of the board. And I found like four or five years ago, he, he wrote a little handbook, which I think was the Dayton family is going, kind of going away guidance to others. And it was called Perspectives. And he talked about 
um, the, the constituents that I shared, you know, the, the shareholders, the team, the, the, the organization, um, and the community. And he said, you know, like, the way we think about it, the number one, the first thing you need to think about is your community. And a stronger community enables you to thrive. Um, and it really, I, I um, you know, for a number of different reasons in my life, I've, I've believe I've, I've supported things, but like I, I read that and I was like, and when we first started, we couldn't, I mean, we could barely make payroll. Like, you know, I'd have to walk around and talk to people. Hey, like, I'll pay you Tuesday and start Friday, okay? You know, type of thing. But, you know, so it was like we had to take care of our community, you know, first. Um, but now we're at a place where we can think about how do we make a difference for, for the ocean and, and help everybody rise. And, and we have a Champions of Change initiative that's super important to us where we've dedicated uh, a number of people that um, work with nonprofits and we give pro bono all of our work um, to these different communi community groups that, um, you know, our, our team appreciates the opportunity to use their expertise to help out. And then we, we're making a difference, like we're measuring our impact. So that's one way, you know, and then we support um, different initiatives within the community that have like similar values as us, you know? And, and so, I don't know, like, again, we're, we're self-funded so we can make those decisions and just say, well, let's just do this because it's the right thing to do versus get approval and that, that that's, perhaps easier to do for someone like us than others. Yeah, definitely. Well, we have a few minutes for audience Q&A, and I want to make sure that we open, open that up. So what questions do we have from the audience? Are you... Hi, Dale. You and I met with Patrick last yeah. night. Yeah. Um, one of the questions I thought about on the way home was, and we touched about, on it a bit, in my recruiting world, right, everyone's trying to figure out work from home, hybrid, bring them back to the office. And you're onboarding a lot of people. How are you, and then how is the team handling team, culture, communication? Does everybody have to come back? Do they get to choose? Like, what's that process for you all? Yeah, we've kind of landed on, like, I trust my team members to make the right decision for themselves, you know, and like when you're accountable, it starts with being accountable to yourself, right? So you have to make yourself in a good place and your, your, your close you know, family or community or whoever is important to you um, that enables you to be accountable to te your, your team and your clients and to Aveda, right? So we, we enable, we're a hybrid organization. Um, people can choose to, to come in or not come in. We're set up, you know, we've got all the infrastructure in place. Um, we say, hey, if you're gonna, if you're choosing to come in one day, come in on a Tuesday. It's when we have our all team stand up, and we get, you know, I don't know, 70ish percent of the people in the in, in the city to come in. Um, our our lower days are about 30, but it's all choice, um, you know. And like, I, I feel like, I think this, I I don't think um, the work place where people work will be solve or you know answered until probably four or five years from now you know like we're early days so we're just testing stuff and just listening to our team members you know what works what doesn't work and um and trying to figure it out but i i feel like with their voices and um I, we're, we're, like we when it first started we were very committed on connecting people I was a little, we have many young people who might be you know, in a small apartment with three other people and no windows and, you know, like it's, you know, and that gets tough, right? So how do we create platforms for people to connect? And we've shifted this year to focus more on learning. And are we creating environments where people can learn in hybrid environments, which we think is more important for people's progress? I mean, certainly connecting and have strong mental health is very important, but um, learning is part of having great mental health too, right? You know, and having that environment. So we're trying to figure that out. I, I, when I talk to my team, you know, they're like, I'm super efficient, you know, working from home. I'm like, ooh, really? I'm not sure I want you to be efficient. Like when I'm learning stuff, I'm not efficient. I'm 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 learning, <laughs> you know. So I'm a little bit nervous that you're telling me all you're focused on is being efficient because that means you're not stretching yourself. And we're, you know, so what what's the 
balance there. You know, I, I get there's times where you have to be efficient. I don't, don't mean to diminish efficiency, but like the balance is super important and people kind of lose that. And so we're trying to figure that out. And uh, the, the, other, the, fl the other part of it is like, premium space, like this is a super nice space, you know, the, our, our office is super nice, so we want to create an environment where people want to come in, right, and when they come in, they're like, oh, this is great, you know. Um. And it is great, You're, yeah. Even, even when we met earlier this year, yeah. there were a lot of folks in office as people were kind of re-emerging uh, because you haven't created a space that people like to be in together. Uh, what's the next question? And it looks like we're at times. So we're actually going to have to save questions. Dale, I'd like to thank you so much uh, for joining us on the stage, for sharing your lessons of growth. The Ovative team is here today. They actually have another session on this stage a little later in the day. So if you're interested in learning more about the way that, that this team is developing and affecting community and clients in a really impactful way, uh, be sure to join them this afternoon. Thank you for sharing the stage. Well, thank you me. for this opportunity. Thank you for all of you.